All right, let's just pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. Lord, we thank you right now for the, the works you're doing in lives, Lord, yeah. and these testimonies, Lord, and the appreciation that, that they have for what you have done and what you are doing for them and through them, Lord. And we just ask that you continue to use us as willing vessels, Lord, to just carry out your work here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Scott, was he, did he leave? Scott, please share more with us when you feel like you should. That blessed me. <laughs> and what I'm going to teach on, which isn't ironic or uh, coincident, is about the Father's love. That's the message today. So that was a good lead in. I was at home and I was um, looking for a devotional and I grabbed one and uh, it was from 2014. So I'm looking around for the current one, you know, on that date, read that day's devotion. I couldn't find it. So I said, well, let me just pull this one open and I'll go to my birthday, September the 13th. That's September the 13th. <laughs> Might put that on the board too. <laughs> so I, um, I wanted to, I just said, I'll read that since it's my birthday and I'm out of date and I don't have the current one. And if you'll put on the board, uh, Jeremiah 31, 20. And that's the verse that went with the uh, message. Jeremiah 31, 20. And it says, Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a darling child and beloved? For as often as I speak against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore my affection is stirred and my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy, pity, and loving kindness for him, says the Lord. And from that verse, I'm going to read just what a devotion says. I remember my father saying to me, This is going to hurt me more than it is you. Uh -huh. No one believed that when you heard that, though, did you? <laughs> I never understood that phrase until I had a son of my own. One day I found myself saying the exact same thing to my son, and he didn't understand me either. <laughs> How can that be, Dad? <laughs> but suddenly I remember my father and knew what he meant. He was telling the truth. The heart of a father is filled with love for his children. Isn't that what we've heard here so far today? It's about his love. And when discipline is required, the parent is the one most troubled. God's words through Jeremiah have the heartbeat of a father. He is hurt over Ephraim's sin. He wants the best for his child who is choosing the worst. He is troubled over those poor decisions and longingly waits to act on his compassion to bring restoration. God, our Father, loves us, remembers us, and waits even today to show us mercy. Amen. God, where are you? I'm waiting on you. Well, God, where are you? Well, I'm waiting on you. God, where are you? Well, I'm waiting on you. But you have to do something. <laughs> You have to exercise your will and submit to the Father. So I, was, I pondered on that. <clears throat> and right in that same time, I was awaiting jury trial, jury duty. Now, I've been in jury duty before, and it happened to be my first one. And I went, and it was a murder case. How do you go to your first one and it's a murder case? And then you get chose to be the foreman. So, okay, Lord, I see where this is going. Willing vessel, remember. So in this jury, this was a, a case, um, another serious case about methamphetamine uh, cooking house, drug house. I got educated on what methamphetamine is but I've already forgot it, thank God. <laughs> so I went to the, to the uh, jury trial and went through it, and, um, you know, the, the I don't want to say young man, he's my age, it looked like, um, you know, he was on trial 
for being a meth lab cooker is what they call it, making the drug. And, you know, his defense was, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It sure is funny how we can be in the wrong place at the wrong time on purpose. <laughs> you know, if you walk across the street and didn't look and, and when over there in a car might closely hit you, that's the wrong place at the wrong time. But if you go over there and you see the car and you still walk out in the street, you were in the wrong place on purpose. You get the difference? <laughs> so wrong place, wrong time. The blame game, the devil made me do it. Had nothing to do with my actions. The devil made me do it. So there was the scapegoat. So we're listening to this, this trial. Now, in the midst of it, you know, I'm looking at the man. And I like, I'm, I like structure. I like the rules. Look, you're not going to have a better time than me in life. I love life. But I also like discipline, and we have rules to follow. We have order. And I'm looking at the young man, and I'm thinking, what, what would make you at that age just go wild and participate in something like this? Uh, we didn't know at the time, but he had no prior record. He worked. Wrong place, wrong time. Voluntarily, by the way. So... We're going through the trial and we're hearing all this and the last day of the trial we left for lunch and come back and while we're out I said Lord I know you're going to make me be the jerk not make me but I know you're going to have me be the the uh the foreman now the judge in this case was waiting to pick the foreman so we go back and every day we were in there you just go into the seats and this lady would stop and take the end seat for some reason. Well, when we went back in this last time, she walks in, she stops at the seat, goes to sit down, stops, gets up, and walks down a couple more seats and sits down. And then I get the last seat. This isn't coincidence. So the judge goes into, well, I'm going to pick a foreman now. Mr. Uh, gentleman, what is your name? Charles Ferguson. Well, since you're in that seat, you're going to be the foreman. Now, that wasn't a coincidence. She literally stopped, and I'm going to sit in my seat. I've been sitting in for the last two days, and she got up and moved down two seats. So God uses a vessel that's willing. Now, you'll see, I'll tell you why this is, this is important. Because, see, we got rules. We have to follow regulations and rules. We also have compassion, but you've got to intertwine. You've got to have a balance. So we listen to this whole thing. We go back to deliberate. And compassion's bubbling up inside. I'd like to get out of the seat, go over to the young man, and hug him and say, look, man, you made, a, you made a mistake. But see, he wasn't willing to own up to it. He wanted to do the blame game. Wrong place, wrong time. That devil made me do it. Was well, that lady's house? It ain't mine. It's everyone else's fault. So we go through it, but compassion still now, you're still looking at the guy. He's guilty, but you still want compassion. So you go back to the jury room, we're talking about it, and I'd go through my normal thing as the foreman, and, and I see it happening. Compassion mixed with emotion. That's a bad brew sometimes. Because see, the emotion gets in the way of right and wrong sometimes. So the compassion mixed with the emotion, well, maybe, maybe we can find him guilty on this charge, but not the other charge. Whoa. No, no. So I had to go back and balance them out and explain the definition of what the guy was being charged with. We're not here to be emotional about it and it's not our job to even have the compassion on him that's going to be the judge's job when she passes sentence on him our job is just to define the law and judge what happened based on that law so god used me to kind of work that thing back in let's walk back through it 
and we found the, the guilty on two charges. So we go back out, do the verdict, yes, guilty, guilty, go through the process. Well, the people on the jury um, wanted to sit for the verdict, okay? So this is where it comes back around now, the blame game. So we sit through the verdict. Now, this is all going to God's love, so just be patient with me. Now, during that part, you heard a little more about, his, about the, the case that we didn't hear during the trial, where he admitted he'd stayed at this house several times, the lady was his girlfriend. So, wrong place, wrong time. I know what's going on here, I'm fully involved with it. But for these people, I'm going to tell them I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and blame it on somebody else. Now, during this, he had a decision, see? He could have any time, 1 John 1, 9, any time he could have said, Judge, I, I got to tell you something. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. And I want to admit, I want to be truthful and honest with you, and I plead mercy. I'd like some mercy. I made a mistake. But he didn't do that. He made a choice to not say nothing. To just go along with, maybe I'll get out of this. Maybe they'll really think I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. So we go through this and we hear that. And the whole time, his mo this is a sad thing. A grown man and his mom and his sister sitting here having to deal with this. And the whole time, they keep looking back at us, the jury, because we sat near the back to hear the verdict, and they're peering an eye through us. All of a sudden, we're the guilty party. We're the problem. So it's got nothing to do now with what he's done. It's got something to do with who held him accountable. Funny. So not only is he trying to do the wrong place, wrong time, the devil made me do it. See them people on that jury? They're the problem. My son's going to jail because of you. Nothing to do with his actions. No accountability. All the same time, compassion. I said, Lord, why won't he just get up and just say, I'm guilty? But he wouldn't do it. So, here you go through something like that, and their job was to say, okay, if you have one reasonable doubt about any of this evidence that you were shown about his guilt, you have to find him not guilty. If you have one reasonable doubt, it could be a line, a train full of evidence, but if you have one reasonable doubt, you have to find him not guilty. Now let's reverse that. God made a plan for us. Listen, I see your sin here. I see your shame here. I, there's all this evidence mounted against you, and you're already guilty. But if you'll just, you, if you'll just make one choice, I'll find you not guilty. He had one choice. He could have got up and said, hey, I've made a mistake. I want mercy. As a Christian, you had to make that choice one time in your life to go, I am wrong, and I want to be made righteous, Lord. You've got to make that choice. You've got to make that choice. Because what it's about the Father's love for us. See, this is about the Father's love, that provision he made. Is about his love for his creation. He passionately loves us. Passionately loves us. So, all, all the evidence, all the evidence is laid out. And the judge is looking at you. If you don't speak up, I'm going to find you guilty. Not by my choice, but by your own. Because you're not, you're not saying anything that you need to say. You're letting the evidence outweigh 
the choice you can make. And we get under that guilt and that condemnation and so many people just stay there and never realize, man, if I just make one choice, I'll be set free. Now listen, the world wants to go, well then, why do you have problems? He never said, I don't never see it in scripture that, listen, I'll bypass the consequences of your choices. He doesn't say that. It says you will have trials and tribulations. You have to face the consequences of your choices. When you become saved, you want the good consequence of being saved, but you want to forget, well, I made these other choices and I don't want those consequences. But that is not how it works, folks. That's not how it works. But if you'll make a choice for him, he'll work with you to get through those consequences better than you ever will on your own. And the Father is compassionate for us. Son, if you'll just tell me what the problem is, I'll help you. But if you don't tell me, I can't help you. Now, I'm not going to do it for you, but I'm going to help you. How do you learn to do anything if someone always does something for you? I don't want to face the consequence. That young man in that trial didn't want to face the consequence. We have to face, there's the good consequence and the bad consequence, but you have to face them. You have to face them. Put on John 3.16. We went over it this morning. John 3.16, for God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten son so that whoever believes in, trusts in, clings to, relies on him shall not perish, come to destruction, be lost, but have eternal lasting life. Now that's quoted numerous times through our life, but you almost get complacent. You got to realize what that thing is saying. That scripture is potent. Let's go to the next one. For God did not send the Son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, or to pass sentence on the world, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through Him. There's that choice. You mean I don't have to face the guilt? I don't have to be condemned? All I have to do is make one choice and I can be set free of everything above that? Mmm, powerful. Verse 18. He who believes in him, who clings to, trusts in, relies on him, is not judged. He who trusts him never comes up for judgment. For there is no rejection, no condemnation. He incurs no damnation. That's a pretty good deal, folks. You mean I ain't never got to go to another jury trial? I'm not going to be sentenced? I got a free get out of jail card? That's awesome. I'm going to take him up on that. But he who does not believe, cleave to, rely on, and trust in him is judged already. We're born into that. He has already been convicted and has already received his sentence. Who wants to keep that? No one. No one in this room, I don't believe. Because he has not believed in and trusted in the name of the only begotten Son of God, he is condemned for refusing to let his trust rest in Christ's name. Hmm. 19. The basis of the judgment indictment, the test by which men are judged, the ground for the sentence lies in this. The light has come into the world, and people have loved the darkness rather than and more than the light, for their works, deeds were evil. Number 20. For every wrongdoer hates, loathes, detests the light. Remember how they were peering at us? searing right through us 
we were being the light in that circumstance. We were, we were doing what we were called to do, but they were hating me. You did this to my son. You did this to my brother. Who do you think you are? For every wrongdoer hates, loathes, detests the light, and will not come out into the light, but shrinks from it, lest his works, his deeds, his activities, his conduct be exposed and reproved. And then number 21 also. But he who practices truth, who does what is right, comes out into the light, so that his works may be plainly shown to be what they are, wrought with God, divinely prompted, done with God's help, and dependence upon him. Just like I was saying, the Father wants to help you. He wants to walk through this with you and help you and, and see you through it. But you have to let him. You have to let him. I'm guilty of a lot of things, have been guilty of a lot of things. And I will trip up in the future on some things. But I am clean. I'm clean. Because I believe the Father is 100% absolutely truthful with me. And he said, son, Charles in particular, if you'll believe in, trust in me, even though you may fall through this life, you're clean in my sight. You have no fault with me. I will be your loving Father regardless. That's a blessed assurance, Pastor Bob. Now, I want to bring this into a little bit on prayer. So let's go to uh, 1 John 5, 13. And it all ties back into his love. 1 John 5, 13. <clears throat> Got it. I write this to you who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on the name of the Son of God and the peculiar and the peculiar hey God <laughs> the peculiar services and blessings conferred by him on men, so that you may know with settled and absolute knowledge that you already have life, yes, eternal life. Fourteen. And in this confidence, Willie, there's that confidence. The assurance, the privilege of boldness, which we have in him, we are sure that if we ask anything, make any request according to his will, in agreement with his own plan, he listens to and hears us. Next verse. And if since we positively know that he listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know with settled in absolutely knowledge that we have granted us our present possessions the request made of him. Now, that's on prayer. But what is prayer about? It's about connecting that love. And that's an avenue we use. Now, if we look at the verse again, the privilege a boldness which you have in him, we are sure that if we ask anything, make any request according to his will. According to his will. See, a lot of people skip that portion. Well, Lord, I've been praying for this and you ain't answering me. It's not in my will for you. But see, we get selfish about what we want or what we think we need and God's like, no, that's not going to line up with my will. You know, here's a big one, people always, Lord, if you could, listen, Lord, I just, boy, if you could bless me with $50,000, all my problems would be solved. <laughs> and the Lord's up there going, no, because see, I already know you, and I know how your behavior is, and I know that if you get that kind of money in your hand, within a month, you'll be a mess. But now the world wants to go, well, God's not a loving God. Oh, it's a great God. 
Just like God, as Scott said, what God would want to trip you up purposely. But see, the world wants you to make you think, well, you're praying for stuff, you ain't getting any of it. I don't see none of this stuff happening for you. Well, that's the worldview. But if it's in his will, oh, it's going to come to fruition in his time, too. Love. Dad, can I have that sports car? Do that Mustang. It really is fast. Son, I'd love for you to have it when you're mature enough. See, if I give it to you now, you will drive down that road and kill yourself in it. Why would I want to hurt you by granting your prayer, your request you made of me, and it's not the time. And it's not my will for you to kill yourself, son. So no. Oh, my feelings are hurt. <laughs> me. And in the worst case scenario, well, forget you, God. You said all the desires in my heart. But don't forget the part according to his will. Think about it now. When you pray from now on, you're praying for you or you're praying for God's will to be manifest in your life. Now, prayer is good. And we, we pray for things we need and want. That's good. And if they line up with God's will, that's great. But you know when prayer really starts functioning in that love is when you turn the corner and your prayer ain't about you. Your prayer ain't about your needs and your wants. Your prayer is about the people. The, the, just like in the movie um, Courageous when the man is walking down the hall and praying on those lockers and, and is praying for revival. Or the war room where the lady is saying, Lord, raise up a nation of believers. They turned the corner. Their prayers weren't for them. Their prayers were for the people. Love. When you're praying for something you need, it's out of, I need this. When you're praying for people's lives, that's out of love. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with the one, but the other is so powerful. When you turn that corner and you learn to pray for things that have nothing to do with you, and you genuinely are praying for people, that's love. That's the Father's love working through you. He needs vessels, remember. There's no need to have weapons if you don't have an army to grab them. And all the weapons he possesses for you to use, they're useless unless you pick it up, point it, aim it, and pull the trigger. Oh, that doesn't sound loving. Oh, yes, it is. Because when the enemy's attacking you, you're going to pull up any weapon you got to protect you, your family, anything you have in your possession you will use it. You better use it or you're done. And what kind of father provides the weapons, the tools, and then looks at you and go, are you ever going to use what I gave you? You say you love me, but you won't even keep my commandment. You won't even do what I'm telling you to do, but you love me. See, we got a lot of religious people that love the Lord. Minister, I love the Lord. I'm having an affair on my wife, but I love the Lord. Yeah. I love the Lord, but I stole money out of the church's funds. I love the Lord. I put on such a nice show, but in my secret place, I'm hiding it all. I love the Lord. And I tell the people I love the Lord, but I don't keep his commandments to me. I don't obey my father. If you don't obey your father, you hate him. You do not love him. There is no gray area. You either love or hate. He speaks very boldly and brass about lukewarm people. Pull it out in the scripture, study it. You either love or hate. Why? Because we were born, sin we had this sinful nature. Sin hates. It's against God. 
So if you love God, but you messing around with stuff that doesn't love God, you might not really love God. And the Father is, what is he doing? He is awaiting. I'm just waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to decide whether you really love me or not. Peter, do you love me? Peter, he asked his disciples, do you love me? Well, then do what you're supposed to do. Do what I'm telling you to do. You know, if my father asked me to cut the grass and I don't cut the grass, I'm not just being lazy. I'm being disrespectful. I'm pretty much telling him, look, man, I hear what you're saying, but it don't mean nothing to me. And if it don't mean nothing to me, you really don't mean nothing to me. So you got to make up your mind to be in this or out of it. You're going to play around with this life, and one day it's going to be too late. You keep playing around with it. You stick your hand on a hot stove, and you do it again and again. Soon you can't even recognize your hand. You done burned and charred it up so bad, you don't even remember what it felt like to have a normal hand on your body. And all of a sudden your heart's cold toward the whole thing. And a cold heart doesn't love. Doesn't love nothing. Christmas message. <laughs> now people, what do they equate uh, prayers with? The world equates prayer with problems. Because so much of it is about, oh, this is tragedies having pray. This and that's fine. But they equate prayer with a problem. You know what I like to do? I like to equate prayer with the promise. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Get prayer off the problem and put prayer on the promise. Amen. See, we all wait to pray when something's wrong. I like to pray when it's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's say I'm a millionaire. Lord, I know I got $10 million, but I'd like 10 more. Well, he's greedy. No, see? What I could do with the extra 10 is give it back into your ministry. See, we like, to t we like to call people out on, well, that's greedy. That's being uh, uh, selfish. He's got everything he needs. No, he doesn't. If he's got a plan and something to do with this extra money, he's looking for it for a reason. Why not ask his father for it? Boy, why is he praying for that? He's got it. I mean, he, you got to pray according to his will. See, that man's life may have something that he's, God may be going to use that guy down the road for something big. Oh, well, you know, I, I feel guilty to pray for things. I've got such a good life. That's the worldview. I got a brand new car and I'm praying for another car. What a selfish of you. But if you got your car broke down and you're praying for a new car, oh, that's all. Oh, yeah, let's pray for it. See, we put our mind and our emotion and our heart into what people are praying for. And if we would just focus on, Lord, help me be a prayer warrior. Help me align my prayers with your will. Help me turn the corner and pray out of love instead out of maybe some selfishness or just some things I think I need and want. And turn my heart into a loving heart that I'll pray. Listen, the other month, and I think it was at the prayer uh, Bible study, I prayed for ISIS. Yeah. I prayed for my enemy because God tells me yeah. so I don't have to tell you I love God I did what he told me to do so God knows I love him Charles you praying for people who want to kill you yes is it easy no would I kill them dead if they were here trying to kill us yes I would Total different thing than love, okay? 
totally different, totally different. So prayer and compassion and love all intertwined. You've got to use it to your, to your benefit. So again, you know, let's see, I got, I got a beautiful wife. I got lovely children. I got, man, that book really looks good, don't it? Turn to page 65, you start seeing some of my troubles. Then go over 79, you can read some more. See, and then back to the index, and you can look them all up. Woo, that boy's got some problems going on. But I'm looking at the promise. I'm not focused on them problems. I am looking for the promise. And I pray for the promise. And yeah, when I need to pray for things that are just, woo, this is, this is awful, we need to pray for this. But I want you to know that at your best, you still need to be a prayer warrior. When things are going so good for you, your cup is running over, you still need to be praying. You still need to be praying. In fact, you talking about effectual prayer? When there ain't nothing you need and you've got everything, but you say, Lord, I'm asking your provision to be poured on me. I want your blessing, Lord. God, he don't have no line going, you know what, I gave him all this and I'm going to stop him there. The only one that stops him there is you. There's something not in your life and you're looking at the mark going, well, I guess that's it for me. But God's got a big old racer. He can race that line and make the line. Ain't going up there, way up there. The promise. The promise. Let's go to John 14. I'll get there in a minute. John 14, 21. The person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me. There's what I just said. Let me read that again. The person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my father. And I too will love him and will show, reveal, manifest. Remember, you want something in your life to be manifested? Well, then fall in love with the father. Manifest myself to him. I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. God is not a fictional character. Star Wars is fictional. God is the truth. He is not a fictional character. But we make him fictional because we don't think he can really be in our life. I can't touch, you can touch God, you can wrap your arms around him, you can feel his presence. Sure, you don't see his body. You got something better than that. You got him inside of you. If you'll let him be inside of you, how much more intimate can it be for him to be living in you and you living in him? I can't describe any more intimate than that. I will manifest, manifest myself to him. The person who keeps my commands really loves me. Yep, but when I trip up, what about that? He still loves you. He's going to have to get the switch off the tree and give you a spanking no. Because correction is good. If you don't want to be corrected, you may as well reverse yourself, stick your head in the ground, and put your feet up. Because that's where you're going to stay. 
stuck in the mud. God's correction is beautiful. It is a love story. you got to think of this thing and what it is. God of this universe made you, made me. How much more love can you have? If you feel so strongly about something that you're going to actually pull it out of the earth and form it and make it. I love this creation I've made. And I've put something inside of my creation that if he or she exercises his will, they'll love me too. See, he didn't make a puppet. He didn't make a puppet. He made you a vessel, and what he wants to see is that going to be a willing vessel. Are you a willing vessel? Are you a willing vessel? Just like she said, make me come to church. No one's making anyone come to church. Are you a willing vessel? Do you want to be involved with a body of believers who edifies, who lifts up? who magnifies his name? Or do you just want to be a puppet on a string just going through the motions, never really knowing what love is? And I don't care what your background is, what's your story. The past is the past. Today we're right here, right now. And then we got a future. So you can make your mind up now to forget all your hurts. Take your chalkboard that you're keeping a list of it on and just go ahead and wrap it over. Tell it bye-bye. I'm forgetting all my hurts and all the things I'm hung up on, and I'm just going to learn how to love. You're looking at a guy that if I wanted to keep my chalkboard, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be out there chalking up some more people on that chalkboard. See, if we're going to concentrate on that stuff, you will not operate in love. You'll have moments. Sure, I have my good days. But I'm waiting to get them people on my chalkboard. I've got something to prove. I've got some vengeance in mind. Chalkboard effect is what I call it. Well, you can take your big eraser that God's got for you and say, God, would you erase all them for me? I don't want them no more. I want to operate in love. Now, let me tell you something about love. Love doesn't mean that everything's okay. See the world likes to see the world likes to use the scriptures and the Bible and your thoughts about God against against common sense actually. Love doesn't mean everything's okay. All right? I love my wife, but I'm a rascal sometimes. And I've deserved a wrath more than a few times. But it doesn't change the love right. for my wife. Sometimes I hurt her feelings. Sometimes she hurts mine just a little bit. <laughs> but it doesn't change the love. The only thing that will change the love is if one of us decides not to love the other. And that's not being obedient, is it, Pastor Bob? Because, see, when I married my wife... We got married by some Christian principles. You gonna love your wife? Yep. You know what? If you don't love your wife, then you don't love me. And I know there's marriages that went away, and, and, but listen, there was something wrong. There was something wrong. Because once you set your mind on love, and you commit to the love, you go with it. But if there's something blocking, if there's something in the way, something will crumble that relationship. Just like the father says, you know, son, you say you love me. But six out of seven days, you're doing everything wrong. You're doing everything against me. You're not obeying me. I'm telling you every day what to do and you're disobeying me. So you can say you love me and I hear you but your actions tell me you don't. This tongue likes to tell a lot of things. 
but the way you walk tells more than your tongue ever will. So you can talk all you want to. You can quote every scripture you want to. But unless you really mean that you love the Father, it's fruitless. You can be learned. You can study it all. But if you don't submit your will to being in love with the Father, not just accepting Him as God, I want to be in love. It, you love your parents, right? You love your children? Then how much more in love should you be with the, the God who created you? Who blessed you with the wife? Who blessed you with the children? Who blessed you with everything? Not just right now, but man, I'm looking at that eternal just all the way through. You know, I walk around in this body right now, and I feel pretty good these days, Pastor Bob. But I'm looking forward, man, that glorified body. Man, that's going to be something. And I got a job to do here now, but boy, I've still got my own promise. I'm waiting for that promise to be manifested. That's going to be awesome, that promise that's going to manifest. And we're all going to be up there, and it's going to be a... Let me, let me explain something to you. One day... When you go to heaven and you're up there and you're glorified bodies and you're, it ain't going to be your same old house with your same old neighbors and your same old relationship. It's all a love relationship up there. Amen. It is all a love relationship. Amen. Everyone is brother. Everyone is, everyone is in a love connected relationship. There's no favoritism. There's no, eh, I kind of like you. I am madly in love. It's going to be a glorified body is going to be madly in love with the glorified bodies. You understand what I'm saying? All right? That's going to be love. So right now, while we're in these vessels, you've got to do your best to love people. You don't have to agree with wrongdoing. You don't agree with the sin. You don't agree with the raw emotions. But you love. You love. Out of my own personal life, let me tell you something. I've had some... Whew, you talking about some peering eyes right through you. I've had some close, personal family just look at you with pure hate. And thank God that He grabbed me and wouldn't let me go to exercise what I really wanted to exercise out of my vessel. You know, I wanted to put some punishment back and some, you poking me in the eye, why are you poking me? I'm going to poke you back in the eye. And, oh, I love my brother, and I'll do everything against him at the same time. So God said, son, you're going to do one of two things, better or bitter. Either love or hate. Either I'm going to love that person or I'm going to hate them. And hating them tells me that although I'm a Christian, I don't love God. You don't have to hate anybody, people. You choose to hate them. That's got nothing to do with what they're doing to you or not doing for you. It's got nothing to do with the emotion. It's got something to do with a choice that you make, you either love or hate. I love God's, I've come to a point in my life, I love God's creation. I don't agree with everything God's creation is doing from time to time, but I love them. I, there's a mass, you know, there's a murderer out there somewhere, and I'm commanded to love him. The world wants to say something crazy about that, but see, I'm commanded to love him. Now, he's got a face of punishment. It's got nothing to do with me. All I can do is love him and pray for him. I didn't say I agree with him. I don't condone it. But if I go on hating him, that's saying I really hate myself, I hate God, I hate the whole thing. Hate is of the devil. And I don't blame the devil for my problems anymore. I know he's there, and I know once in a while he wants to pick a fight, but he's got a warrior here. I'll punch him right in his face. Okay? 
and I punch him for a lot of you. But I'm off the devil. I don't blame nothing on nobody. I got one accountability. I got one accountability to God. My choice is my problem. And I know not to make some choices now because of the love relationship. No more sending them to the moon, Pastor Bob. And I want to sometimes. We all do, because we, we, we got this vessel we're dealing with. But if you let love work in you and manifest through you, you know, there's don't quench the Holy Spirit. Well, don't quench what God may be wanting to do through you. The love you give to someone who don't even expect it or think it's coming may be the very thing that helps change them. Helps change them. Let's go to that next verse of James 5.13. I'm going to leave you enough time to sing, Rachel. James 5.13. Is anyone among you afflicted, ill-treated, suffering evil? He should pray. Is anyone glad at heart? He should sing praise to God. Remember, it ain't just when the problems, it's when everything's good. Next verse. Is anyone among you sick? He should call the church elders, the spiritual gods, and they should pray over him, anointing him with oil in the Lord's name. 15. And the prayer that is of faith will save him who is sick, and the Lord will restore him. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. 16. Confess to one another, therefore, your faults. That doesn't say you can only go to a priest and confess your sins. That says confess to one another. And I'm not knocking a religion. I'm telling you the truth. You got issues with one another? Confess things to one another. Solve them. Confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. And pray also for one another, that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Mm. Why isn't my prayer working? Maybe I'm not connected right. Maybe there's something blocking. Someone's dammed up the flow. Seventeen. Elijah was a human being with nature such as we have, with feelings, affections, and a constitution like ours. And he prayed earnestly not for, for it not to rain, and no rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. Eighteen. And then he prayed again, and the heavens supplied rain, and the land produced its crops as usual. 19. My brother, if anyone among you strays from the truth and falls into error and another person brings him back to God, number 20, let the latter one be sure that whoever turns a sinner from his evil course will save that one's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins, procure the pardon of the many sins committed by the convert. You want to know why it's important to pray for people? That scripture right there nails it down. And do you know why you ought to be praying out of a love heart and just instead of a, it's my responsibility? Praying out of love. You don't know the effect you're going to have. You may not see it in your lifetime. You don't know what generation it's going to affect. But pray for them. Pray for them. The world wants to confuse us, and especially non-believers, about Scripture. That is a trick of the devil. He does deserve some blame for that. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working.
of a righteous man. Now, you know there's some people out there who go, what about a woman? What about, what about a, you know, little kid? Little ch-? Don't change scripture. Just get an understanding of it. Because if you go back to Genesis, it goes ahead and solves that problem for anyone thinking, what about me? I'm a woman. Or the world going, you know, they're just talking about men. No, man, let us make mankind in our image. Male and female. When he's referring to man, righteous man, he's referring to us. Righteous Bob, righteous Sarah, right, whoever. Okay? But the trick is to take something so simple and put something so confound in people's minds that they'll take a scripture like that and try to use it as a weapon against you. Now, I don't know if anyone's ever kind of put it in that format for you, but that is one trick. But it's, it's plainly clear. It's in Genesis. Go in there and read it. We'll make mankind. So that's the verb. That's the, that's the, the language he uses for man, for us. Male and female. But the world will try to trip you up. The devil is looking to get you. (sighs) He's going to bite it soon. Look, it's tantalizing. Whoop, I got a nibble. (sniffs) Got him hooked. Don't get off course. Prayer and love. It's a combination If you'll use a loving prayer in your life, you'll see some manifestations that you've never seen before. And if you feel like there's something wrong in your life, that something isn't working between you and God, just get in your closet and work it out. God, you know, I thought I loved you, but I've been, I've not, I've showed you hate. I want to love you. I don't want to hate you. So that means I've got to be obedient to you as my father. Help me put an end to the junk in my life. Get me off the praying for the problem. Get me back on to praying for the promise. I want to pray for the promise. Problems are coming. You'll have enough time to pray for problems. But get on the promise, okay? Pray for people not because you think you should. Pray for them because you're a willing vessel to do God's good work. God will use you in so many ways. Just like he used... Charles, you're going to be the foreman because there's a reason. Because see, all these emotions might get all crazy back there. And this guy who actually should be found guilty, they may let him go. And if they let him go, what kind of problems he going to cause out there? See? See, they, they, they emotional about that guy, but what about the six kids that he might decide to sell some drugs to? See, that had to be stopped. But maybe through him being stopped, and he's at the end of his rope, and there's a guy named Charles Ferguson who stood up and said guilty, was also back there saying, Lord, touch him. Touch him. Use this circumstance in his life to afflict him. Just when he thinks the world is against him, showing that you are stretching out your hand, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'll save you. I know the water's rising, but if you'll just grab my hand, it's over. You're saved. If you'll just grab my hand, if you'll just submit yourself to me instead of the world, Instead of the politically correct thing to say, if you'll submit to me, God Almighty, I'll save you. And I will love you so much, you won't even be able to stand up straight. You'll be so weighed down with my love pouring into you. If you really submit to his love, you you almost will need a break sometimes. Because when you feel the love of God working in your life, 
It should be so overwhelming that you've got to have a time. Tom, Lord, I've got to just lay down for a minute and get, get straightened out because you love me so much, I can't, I can't contemplate it. I can't handle it. Your love overwhelms me so much. You want to see love? That Scott poured out love on his testimony. That's a pure, unadulterated heart that you heard come out of his mouth. Not what he knew, but what manifested in him. What manifested? That wasn't scripted. That wasn't a study, a theologian study. That was God loves me so much, I can't even tell you how much he loves me. I can't explain the love. All I can do is go into tears and say, thank you, God, for loving me. That's what we should have in our lives, that it overwhelms you. It makes you sound foolish to the world, but so wise to God that you can't even utter it. If you can't utter how much he loves you, then you know he really loves you. Because you can't explain his love. All you can do is dive in and feel it and experience it. And in moments of clarity, your responsibility is to share it with people. Let me tell you how I know God loves me. He loves me so much, it weakens me to tears. Joyful tears. Unexplainable tears. And he loves me so much, he's taught me to love my enemy. He's taught me to forgive anyone who, who has betrayed me. He's taught me to forgive and love myself. He's taught me how to go back a generation and say, I forgive you. Or to go back and say, I wronged you. And I want to say, will you forgive me? Quit being hung up on your past hurts and your past relationships that didn't work out or your, eh, I didn't get what I want. And know that you've got a loving God who's got a kingdom waiting for you. You're going to inherit a kingdom. Oh, you can't explain it, can you, Pastor Bob? It's just too much. That is love. You find me someone else that wants to give you everything they have that don't, you know, I, well, I like you. I'll give you some, but I ain't giving you all. No, he says, I want to give you everything. Everything I have is yours. If you just say you love me. And if you say you love me, walk it out. Just be obedient to me, the Father. And it's all yours. That's the love. That's the love. We don't need to misinterpret Scripture. We don't need to change it to please the world. The Scripture is the Scripture. And it's not just there as a past. It is the present and it is the future. Use it. Use it. It is a mighty weapon. The Bible, the Scripture, the book, the Word is a mighty weapon. It is a love affair that if you will use it, will guide you through any problem any circumstance, and then out of that, it'll guide you through the good times. 